<laughs> Hello, everyone, and welcome to the midweek program at the J.C. Ralston Arboretum. My name is Blake, and I'm the education assistant here at the Arboretum. And today we are sat next to one of our rain gardens because we have a program for you today all about bog plants. We've got boggy weather. We've got boggy setting. We've got a whole bunch of little plants here that do well with wet feet. They can be inundated with water, and they can just thrive despite all that. We've got our director of horticulture, Greg Page, over here, who's playing around on his phone as one does. Multitasking. <laughs> and of course, Tim Alderton, our research technician, and they've got a whole bunch of bog plants here that they're going to go through and tell you all about so you can fill in those wet spaces in your garden with some really cool plants. All righty. Those of you joining us on YouTube, please like this video and subscribe to our channel and feel free to leave a comment down below. And with the announcements out of the way, I will pass things over to Greg and Tim to teach us a few things about some bog plants. We know about bog plants? Is that what this is about? I hope so. <laughs> you never know. <laughs> you never know. Um, so what we wanted to do with this topic is not just limit ourselves to bogs and bog plants, bog planters. That's an important topic within itself. Um, Tim and I were talking about, you know, maybe we need to do a bog workshop. Yeah. Um, we're not gonna do that today, but we're going to talk about bog plants and we're gonna use this as kind of a platform to talk about plants that do well in wet situations. Um, there's lots of woody options. There's probably 10 times more herbaceous options for those types of situations. And that can be a big spot or a small spot in your garden. Um, we've even used that avenue of woody plants and trees to translate into plants for urban conditions. If you think about plants that are in bogs or wet areas, those, those are things that can do well in areas where there's not a lot of oxygen. And um, what better example of that than some of our urban soils? So what we're gonna look at today are things that can kind of take some of those wet areas, things that, that I like, things that Tim likes, and I think a good way to kind of get us in that mood in that direction is Tim has been very lucky to visit a lot of places w within uh, North Carolina that are, are boggy and, and wet. And why don't you start with the, your, okay. the definition that you found? The, of, I found the most, it's, the, it's Oxford great, dic great... the Oxford Dictionary definition was wet, muddy ground, too soft to support body or heavy body. Heavy body. So it's like, that's the most basic. I mean, so just basically a muddy spot. So uh, that you're gonna sink into. And uh, you know, at times we all have that probably in our garden, but there can be a spot that might be perpetually that way. And some of these things might be useful in those situations. And um, like Greg was saying, I've traveled, I know you have traveled way mm -hmm. more than me, but I, I, I have some slides of some places I've been in the last few years. And the first one I have is actually a roadside uh, in Argentina that I was at, it was almost a year about in three yeah. weeks, it'll be a year I was at this place. This was near Cavahui, which is a volcano actually in Western um, Argentina on the uh, Chile border. But there was this uh, meltwater coming down off the mountain into this wet area along the, um, the road. And um, uh, the second slide I have is of one of the plants that we saw there. It's a species of Aranthes, which there were actually three different ones growing in this, this wet area. And I'm going to try to kill one just actually not <laughs> too far out of the sight of here. There's some I planted of, I think, Aranthes, um, or Arethranthes, um, Ludia, or Ludius, something like that. Um, uh, just actually over here, but this is a third species. There was Cupria, Ludius, and then this uh, species, which I don't remember the name of right now. I need to know that in a couple months though, but not today. Uh, so, after that, there, I've also had the opportunity to go some places that some other people may have been to, like Yellowstone of all places. There was this expansive uh, wet meadow uh, along, I think one of the tributaries of the Yellowstone River uh, that was actually not too far from, oh darn, uh, one of the hot springs and it was just down the road from it, but it was covered in the pink flower you're gonna see in there is Pedicularis groenlandica, uh, commonly called elephant. Um, elephant head. Uh, if you saw the flower uh, up close, it looks like it has two big ears, pink ears, and, and uh, it has this uh, upturned, uh, it looks like proboscis or, or trunk on it, it hence elephant heads. Uh, but it was just a whole field of that and it grows in wet areas. I've also seen it in the mountains of Colorado and uh, as well. So, um, but from there, there's a totally 
different extreme. Guadalupe Mountain, uh, and there I was there. That's in the middle of the desert, east of uh, El Paso of all places. It's actually at a spring, uh, Smith Spring. It was on a trail we went on. And there was Lobelia, and um, Adiantum capillus veneris growing all around this, this spring underneath the shade of trees. And it was just constantly wet there. Those would not have survived 50 feet out of side of the zone, but it was just due to the, the perpetual moisture uh, in that area. Uh, so those are some inspiration from outside of this area. And then you get to, uh, the western part of the state, and right now, I guess this part's probably actually open, I think. Uh, vertical bog at Wolf Mountain Overlook on the um, the parkway in uh, out uh, south, uh, west, south, southwest of uh, Asheville. I think that part's actually open. And uh, at that same area, um, uh, not far, maybe a mile or so from that, there, or, no, it's probably three or four miles at least from there, I should say, uh, at uh, Black Mountain, uh, Black Balsam, Bald, there's a cranberry bog yep. actually of all things and uh, so th that is another inspiration we can actually grow cranberries here if you have the if you get them they will grow here right. I have seen them right in Wake County right conditions um, and then go southeast of here uh, to the Carolina bog or a uh, Carolina bays at Jones Lake uh, and uh, the edges of the lake are very high water table and it's a boggy condition. But there, there's actually trees that, uh, like bald cypress and uh, Taxodium disticum, which you'll see in the foreground in that picture, which is the, the beautiful um, browns and coppery tones. And then behind it, there's some really tall conifers. And those are actually Camiciparis thyoides, uh, the Atlantic white cedar, uh, which is a native conifer. And that grows in relatively wet spots, actually, in the wild. And one of my favorite places to go is out to the coast. I have relatives out there uh, near Swansboro and Cedar Point and Emerald Isle. And there is the um, um, Croatan National Forest there. And I go on a, a few places there. But there's Picosins, which are these shrubby bogs, uh, uh, low trees uh, and all kinds of shrubs growing them. And it's just a really cool, bizarre place to go. You walk on them, it feels like you're walking on a sponge because of all <laughs> the, the sphagnum moss that's growing there. It's really cool. But they're very dense, difficult to get into unless there's been a recent fire. Uh, so those are some of the environments that I've visited that I think are really cool and really good examples of um, uh, some things you might be able to try here. Some of the ones from the other places, not so much, but the ones that were here in North Carolina are very feasible. There's just there's just a lot of places out in our environments near and far where we get ideas for, for different plants and what they can do. And you may not have a great big spot in, yeah. in your landscape. It may be, may be something small, but you know, irregardless of the size, that's that that was a good kind of a motivation, and that's that's where we get our ideas from. So I think the next thing that we want to show um, started to go into some of the plants that that we've chosen today, and we've got an assortment of things here. We've got some pictures um, that, that Blake's going to artfully pull up, and it's all going to sew and, and seam together. <laughs> we hope. Um, we hope. <laughs> um, Magnolia virginiana. Um, I'm a huge magnolia file. Um, I spent my entire morning. Um, zooming a Magnolia Society board meeting today. So I'm fresh with magnolias in my brain. And Magnolia virginiana sweet bay is probably one of my top five favorite trees. Um, it's one that has lots of interest. It's one that has really nice flowers. They're very fragrant. It can take wet soil, it can take dry soil. Um, it, can take, it can take shade, it can take sun. It's gonna flower better in sun. But that's a really nice plant, I think, for, for any size landscape. And there's lots of different cultivars. That's one I actually see when I go out to the, the Picosans. Yes, and if, and if you're driving down to that part of the world, they're all along the side of, of the road. Um, you can see them flowering and growing, doing very, very well in those wet, kind of boggy areas. Um, I think there was a picture of um, a, a close-up of the, of the flower, nice clear white, nice lemon fragrance, mm -hmm. um, and then uh, pictures of the leaf. I like silver. the leaf because it's, it's, it's evergreen and the underside is silver, so when that moves in the wind, you get a, that, that dramatic back and forth, and it adds a lot of interest. Um, that's something that, that Doug taught me when I worked with him, is that the movement of plants and, and when things have different colors, that, that's an important reason for selection. 
lots of different cultivars. I think the pictures that I that I gave Blake were uh, one called Santa Rosa. It's probably the most evergreen and my favorite. There's a small one called uh, Percy Page Sweet Thing. Okay, the, that's that, the variegated one. That's kind of it's a round. Or not, oh, okay, a, a I know small, which one you're talking about. Yes. Small round yes. one. Yes. Those are good for for smaller landscapes. So that's something to consider when you're picking out plants for for wet areas, big and small. Is uh, is 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 that size. Um, the next uh, flavor of the month thing that I like, uh, another favorite tree of mine is Nissa sylvatica, black gum. Yeah. Uh, black gum. And that's another plant with the multiple seasons of interest that I like. Are right now incredible fall color. There's one along the fence line that's become through our gate uh, down okay, in, the, in the southwest. Uh, in the southwest corner that's been absolute ablaze for, for two or three weeks now. It's such a great plant for, for fall color. Also a good urban tree because it's used to low oxygen situations. And again, there are tons of different cultivars. There's a few dwarfs out there, there's mm -hmm. weepers, there's fastigiate ones. It's a great tree for, for wet and dry landscapes, but it can take up a, a large amount of, 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 of water. Um, moving into some, some conifers, and Tim uh, mentioned taxodium. That's another plant that's a favorite of mine. It's a deciduous conifer, it loses its needles, and right now producing a lot of color with kind of the, the rusty brown. We've got a, a couple here. Um, this is Jim's little guy, and you can see those needles that are starting to turn kind of rusty brown right now. Uh, just a really, really great plant. For, this one's a real tight one, so it's very, very wonderful tight. for a, a small landscape. Yep. And one of my favorites we have here, and I, I couldn't find pictures of it. Um, it got down to the wire to get pictures to Blake. Uh, Peeve Minaret, yep. and the one that we have in the garden is probably my favorite. Um, that's a plant that I got introduced to by Pat McCracken. He had a bunch of them growing in a pond next to his mm -hmm. house as kind of paying homage to the Pocosin area. Yeah. It was like a mini uh, a mini um, planting of them. Just looked really, really pretty. Uh, just a, a great, great plant for kind of wet situations. Here's a, a seedling that kind of shows the, the nice bark that they have. And this is a plant that I think is destined for our, some of our grafting workshops. Yeah. But um, again, multiple season of interest, winter, spring, summer, fall, there's something nice to They're look at. They're starting to use plant. them more. You'll see them more now, and even here in Raleigh, as being used as street trees, mm. or in those um, um, runoff areas, they put, put them in them. There, I know there's some up on Creedmoor Road. Yeah, uh, uh, water reclamation, uh, those kinds of areas. It's a great, a great plant uh, for, for for that kind of kind of situation, and very, very wide range. They grow pretty much pretty much everywhere. Won't take it as wet, but I have a cousin here. This is the meta sequoia, or the Dawn Redwood, and this is I think Hamlet's Broom. I think is the, you know, the half the names cut off on this one, but anyways. So this is one of the more compact ones, but it, it kind of gives you a similar appearance, mm -hmm. but it doesn't have to be or want to be quite as wet as a but taxodium. It, but it can take a little bit more. It'll grow on the edges of things and it'll get that buttressed shape, but it won't get the knees that you sometimes no, get on the taxodiums. It, it, it doesn't like standing water, but it likes to be close to water where I think it just has the tips of its of its uh, roots in, in water. All the biggest ones I've ever seen are near a lot of water. Uh, the original at the Arnold Arboretum in Boston is planted right close to the edge of the water. I had a huge one in my garden in Charlotte, again, right on the edge of the water, and it develops those huge buttresses, but another really nice conifer that can take kind of wet, wet situations. And I don't know if we have pictures of the next one on the list. I have the, uh, I have the Zenobia picture. I have a picture of that. And actually, we just planted one right over oh, yeah. here um, about a month ago, a month or so ago. So, but yeah, for me, I've, I've got to see the Zenobias in the wild in um, out in the Pitcosins of uh, the Croatan uh, National Forest. And there's actually some places it grows on dry ground mm -hmm. and others in the, right in the Pitcosins, which is the spongy. And I've also seen it in ponds. Edge, and ponds and on the edges of ponds. It's a really versatile thing. It doesn't want to totally dry out uh, in, in my experience to be happy, but I've killed, beautiful I've, I've white killed flowers. A, I've killed a lot of this plant exactly because of that. Yeah. Um, it, it likes some tough love, but we put them in an area where they dried out one summer and they all went Put it in went, a drainage dish and it'll be fine. Yeah, um, and it's another multiple season of interest plant. Great white flower, yeah. the foliage is nice. It, it'll get some sheens of, of color in the, in in the, the fall. In the fall, it gets the burgundy, or red, I think reds and burgundies. Reds and burgundies, kind of all yeah. at the same time, and maybe yeah. orange in, in yeah. some situations. But it's it's one of those underutilized things that not enough people are, are, are growing it. I'm trying to think of who they're 
introduced me that, to that plan. Uh, did, um, uh, Woodlanders Nursery. That's what I was going to say. Yeah. Was, um, was, I'm blanking on their names. That was the first place that I, they, that I saw uh, that. Was it the... We had a, we have one actually near the Woodlanders sorry. Blue. Okay, we used to have that. We don't have that one. What's Blue the raspberry one? one. Um, or, anyways, there's a yeah. pink form too. Yeah. Normally they're clear white and um, larger than a clethra, which is our next one Go. on the list. Uh, and clethras are pretty commonly uh, used in landscapes, at least. But they can take that wet or fairly wet conditions that you would get on the edge of a bog uh, without having too much consequences. And they do grow right alongside the nissas. Uh, I mean, not actually Nissas too, uh, mm -hmm. uh, the uh, Zenobias, mm -hmm. um, and it, probably even with the Taxodiums mm -hmm. uh, out on the, uh, the coastal plain. So you can see all those. And I have a couple selections that I found pictures of that we had in our collection. Uh, one is Clethra ulnifolia, and it's uh, Soti? Is that yep. Soti? Yep. Soti? Uh, you might find it as White Dove. And then my favorite is um, uh, Ruby Spice, so one nice of the pink one. flowered ones. Uh, and I actually grew that one back home in Pennsylvania for years. Um, but there's several other ones. There's some more compact ones. Uh, Ruby Spice is probably going to get four to five feet tall, maybe six if it's on a really good time. Soti, I think, is um, Soti is uh, a compact one. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe like an improvement over ha a Hummingbird, which is one of the first ones I got to, to know as I interned to Callaway Gardens where it originated and I remember the Hummingbird uh, Lake which is where it was actually growing aside uh, on the side of it and growing right into the water's edge that wet area there so that's um, that's a great plant that attracts pollinators oh yeah bees um, just adore them. great fall color and it's nice to have trees and shrubs and things kind of all on that that those different layers of things and again uh, there's a cultivar for any any flavor that you like dwarf and small they ones smell they wonderful smell great yeah when they're in flower yeah yeah, lots and lots of work still being done with those. There was one that we had in one of our plant sales. Um, uh, the name just escaped me. Einstein. Or yes, something. Einstein. Yeah, yeah. it had. That's it was, another compact one. I uh, think kind of crazy flowers, like like Einstein's hair. I think is where the, the name came from. But just magnets for for bees and 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 uh, and pollinators. Um, the, the next, next one, one you it, have, I have a picture of and you have a sample of. Yeah, Cyrilla racemiflora. That's another native that is completely underutilized. And you see that growing in all the situations that, that Tim talked about. But it's a great landscape plant because it's kind of a, a tough love thing. Mm -hmm. It's something that is slowly being introduced into rain gardens and on a list of rain garden uh, plants. Clethra, Clethra is another one. And I'm not sure which cultivar this one that is. That one is, I think it's is it granite, the same as- That might be Graniteville. There, we got that. Pericament there. That might be Graniteville. So, um, you know, nice green foliage, um, tardily de deciduous. Sometimes it'll stay evergreen if, it, if it's cool. You can see the old flower um, seed pods there that are the spent flowers that are still on the plant. Um, another thing that, that bees love. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know Denny, if it's a fragrance. I can't it might have a light fragrance, but I remember Denny Werner has multiples. Uh, yes. type, he has Brisima flora. He has uh, two or three others, two, at least one or two other species in his yard. And they're great big. He has them that are 10, 10 to 12 feet tall. And he goes, the, the bees, he likes to go and lie underneath them whenever the bees are there. Denny, the drove, Denny drove all the way down to Charlotte to see me and he came to see a cultivar of this that I didn't even know I, that I had. And he had seen it there when um, it was planted there long before me coming and he remembered it was there. And he comes to see me and, he, and uh, he's like, I'm gonna see this, this plant. I was like, I have no idea what you're talking about. I was like, I, I know exactly where it is. <laughs> so he showed it to me, it was one that had pink flowers okay. and it was kind of a, a dwarf. Oh, and it was like, yeah, we need to propagate this. Yeah. He drove all the way down here for that. But again, it's it's an underutilized native that does really well in, in tough urban situations. The bark and, on mature ones, have you seen? Yes, I mean, they in, get, in the wild, They can get 10, 15 feet tall and it'll be this cinnamon type bark that peels off. It's kind of like the equivalent of the madrones in the West, I think. Yeah, that's a good analogy. Uh, that's a really good analogy. So. I don't think we have pictures of this one, um, but I gave Blake a list that I think he'll he'll post it at some point on the on the YouTube for you to peruse. Um, I don't really think a Hypericum is as, as liking wet. The ones that I've collected in the wild have been on scraggly, uh, really dry kinds of soils. Um, this is Hypericum lobocarpum, and this is in our rain garden mm -hmm. behind us. And this plant is thriving in, in, in this situation and continuing to, to flower. Um, I had it tucked in this umbrella and a couple of bees landed on it while we were, we were talking. Um, so it, it's good, good for that use, good for the, the 
wet, dry kind of situation. But again, it, it's it's one of those native plants that I think could be used a lot more in, in landscapes. There's and there's a lot of herbaceous ones, but there there's are. some that get pretty tall. What's the, it's the one that starts with L, it's at least so. Oh yeah. Uh, we have it actually in another of our rain gardens and it can get eight or 10 feet tall. And it has these thin needle-like leaves, but I've killed it so many times in the standard <laughs> soil, but it's, it's thriving in our rain garden right now, so. And, um, and, and a lot of these can take a certain amount of cutting back too, because yeah. they're gonna, that's they're gonna happen. Fire is a, a lot of times pretty common yeah. yes. in those wetland situations as a, 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 something that occurs periodically and opens them up. And a lot of these plants therefore are actually quite um, adept at dealing with that yeah. condition. Uh, oh, and I, I, put, I put that there. It's more of like a, um, a it's a, 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 the picture I have is actually here in Raleigh. Uh, it's along Crabtree Creek, uh, about a mile up from the mall. Um, where I used to live in the woods, it's more riparian, but it can take periodic inundation is why yeah. I put that there. And um, and it's actually, it can be fairly shade tolerant too. We mm -hmm. grow, it won't flower as heavily, but it, in the, the sun, it will heavily flower. And it's another one of those ones to put on the edge of things and have yeah. it, its feet a little bit damp, but it's not sitting in the water per se. And you can have our native fringe tree yep. uh, growing you th uh, there. and. Uh, does very well. It's such a, when it flowers in the spring, it's such a welcome to, if you've gone through a dreary winter, the flowers are just immense, big white clouds that kind of float on the plants. Um, and I've, I've seen this used in some kind of wet, kind of reclamation areas mm -hmm. as a plant. And um, there have been some improvements in, uh, I know- um, A white, is it white night? White night is, is one. There's a, there's our emerald night. Emerald night, okay. I, I think. Um, there, there's a there's a couple of native ones that have been developed into cultivars that have longer leaves, darker green leaves, and, and more kind of uniform uniform shape. But it's a, again, it's another one of those underutilized underutilized plants. Sable miner. So uh, this is I'm I'm cheating here. This is sable <laughs> um, uh, 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 myamensis right in front of me, but it's uh, a, a southern cousin of uh, sable miner. But sable miner, the picture I have in the slides there, that's actually Denny and I took a drive down to through South Carolina in March of. 2007 and we apparently stopped. I vaguely remember doing this <laughs> along the road. It was the first time I saw sable miner growing in the wild uh, in big thickets uh, in like the median between the, or off the road, it was wet. Yep. And um, that's, uh, I've seen it out at the coast too in uh, wet areas growing s s partially submerged, yes. <laughs> uh, you know, periodic flooding and it's unfazed, but it'll also take the driest yes. spot. It'll take full sun and it'll take full shade. They are very resilient plants. And the first, uh, the first time I saw it growing in those kinds of situations, I'll it didn't register that it should be doing that, yeah. but it's perfectly adapt at, at those wet conditions. So yeah, that's why I've included that. And I mean, it's, it's one of our two native palms here to North Carolina. Uh, when it's uh, similar conditions, I think, uh, I think the needle palm can- I've seen it in, not uh, as is, wet, but, but yeah, but it can damp take areas. Yeah. shaded damp areas too. So yep. uh, we don't think about growing palms in that situation, but they do quite well. Um, and then hollies, which uh, out here I have Ilex decidua, and I don't remember the cultivar, let's see, Warren's Red. It's one we I think got name. in this spring uh, and I haven't gotten it planted yet but so this is a taller growing species of um, winterberry holly and um, but um, the m more commonly ones I see are uh, Ilex verticillatus and um, I have some slides of uh, winter orange no winter, winter gold, gold and winter red um, it should be called winter orange yeah it's more it's orangey gold. it's not it's orange. orange yeah it's kind of it's it's more rosy yeah, yeah. it has yellow with a rose tint yes. peachy Peachy. peachy, that's a better name. Winter peach. I, I hear about say we start calling it peachy. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, this is another one here. This is, uh, the trade name for this one is Berry Poppins, which is a compact growing one. But um, great for that rain garden or on, again, in that wet spot. I'm going home this weekend uh, to Pennsylvania for Thanksgiving and I, it, it's, I'll probably see some snow, but I will also see in a few spots that um, uh, I know where there are some winterberry hollies growing in wet areas along some of the major highways I will be going by, especially Interstate 80, about 25 minutes near from where my parents, or where I'm, I'm from. So, um, and I expect to see them in full berry right now, especially against the white that we could be having, as my brother informed me, that we could have four inches of snow when I get home. Ugh. So the, the birds love these. Um, I just saw pictures on social media of uh, 
uh, friends at a garden in the Midwest that had planted a bunch of these and the birds have already completely decimated them, um, which isn't a bad thing, no. but uh, it's a great plant for, for that as well. Let's see, what else do I have? Oh, okay, now I've gotten into some um, uh, more herbaceous material here and uh, Asclepia incarnata, the, the swamp milkweed uh, is one of the next ones we have uh, a photo of. And that's actually in the wild again in the um, uh, Croatan National um, um, forest out on the coast. But I mean, I found that growing where I'm from in Western Pennsylvania. It has a really wide distribution and it can take those wet conditions that uh, are gonna be found in the, uh, a bog as well. Uh, we have another species uh, and I always blank on which one it is. I have it down in our cascade. I actually have it growing in the water and it's been there for like four years. Uh, is it, is it perennis? It's, uh, yeah, it's uh, Asclepius perennis and it's a white flowered one. It, it would grow and love to just be in um, wet soil, but it, it will grow actually submerged with its feet submerged in the water perpetually and with no problem. Uh, so there are some of those that you can get away with that you don't think of. And so you can provide some fodder for your um, monarch butterflies if you can convince them to come into the garden, uh, which I have a challenge with at here in the gardens for we, some reason. We need better signage for them. Yeah, <laughs> they don't come until, a, they were on my, one, my tropical ones out at the street a week or so ago, but that's the last only time I saw them this summer. I have a hibiscus. Uh, our, our native hardy hibiscuses uh, uh, are actually grow, their common name are marshmallows. Uh, so they are accustomed to be growing in the edges of things in wet areas and they can take that condition. The one I have a photo of is uh, Jackie Grant, which is from uh, uh, a selection out of Texas, which has been really good for us. It doesn't get hibiscus soft fly. Uh, and so many of our other ones do here, but um, great big soft pink flowers. And uh, it's just a, a really good one. And it's a little bit more silver foliage because I believe it probably has some hibiscus grandiflorus in it, which I think is where that resistance to the soft fly comes. But something a bit more grassy, uh, but not overly weedy. It does spread is uh, Rhychnospora colorata, the white top sedge. And that picture again is from out at the, the coast in the, uh, the uh, Croatian on National Forest, uh, right along uh, the, uh, the road, I think is where I probably took that, but um, it grows in the wet ditches. Uh, you can grow it in evenly moist soil too, but it will be fine and dandy and uh, with its feet in the water. Such um, a beautiful plant. And, yeah, and it's, it's really cool. It's not like its cousin, um, nut sedge, and uh, it, well, it does spread, but it doesn't, not it's not bad. weedy. Uh, and you can get rid of it if you really would want to. Irises, so we have native irises that grow in those boggy conditions as well. The iris that I have pictured in the first one anyways is Iris virginica or virginiana or virginica I should yeah but anyways that is again out in the croaton in a ditch um and then there's a whole complex of uh louisiana type irises which the next iris I think I have if Blake is keeping up to me talking uh <laughs> is Iris brevicollis which is actually over we have it here in the um mixed border we have it in the um uh, old Lawrence border in part shade, but it can be submerged and it's fine and dandy. If, uh, it'll actually stay actively growing all summer long and look green if it's in a wet area. It'll go summer dormant if you grow it on a, a normal soil. What did we find in the berms? Uh, we did a bunch of Louisianas yeah, as well as um, there are some Virgini uh, Virginicas and then there's some Sudatas. Yeah. And that's the other ones uh, that are uh, interesting. They're hybrids between Iris, um, uh, actually I have a Sudata down here somewhere. Let me see, I think it's this one. This is one that we had in our plant sale this spring. This okay. is, I can't even pronounce the name. It's, it, it's, it, it's, uh, uh, Sukiyono? Exactly. Sukiyono maybe? Bless you. Yes, yeah, <laughs> exactly. So. These are, okay, so one parent is the yellow water iris, which is iris sedacris, which is con now considered pretty much a noxious weed. Noxious weed. It is. It uh, spreads through it's beautiful. Uh, uh, streams very easily. It's very fruitful and it, it either breaks off uh, a rhizome or it spreads its seed that float down along and uh, lodge into the, uh, the, the creek banks. So, but you cross it with the Japanese water iris and you get which are a little finicky on how they grow, but they have some really cool colors and a lot bigger. And you get this plant that's very vigorous and it's sterile. So it can't go anywhere unless it gets broken off and divided. And there's some really 
they're really cool muted tones. Has some of the yellows from the yellow water iris, but then the purple tones and pink tones that you can get from uh, that of the uh, Japanese water irises. And the flowers aren't anywhere near as big as the water irises, but they are much more forgiving and easier to grow in a landscape, whether it is wet or dry. Uh, they are pretty much indifferent, um, but Again, you can grow it in a pond, you can grow it in a bog, and it, uh, it will be as happy as a clam, or just in your average garden soil. So it's a really versatile plant and it's not gonna go anywhere and everywhere. So something, going back to some of our natives uh, that I see out at the coast again, and I have a picture, actually it's on our roof and I have it of all places in a bog trough that we have up there, which it gets dried out a little off, more often than it should, but Once they do survive, um, are my Calipogon tuberosus. So that is, oh darn, what's the common name? Grass pinks, I think is a common name for them. Uh, it is a, uh, uh, one of our native orchids out at the coast. And it's one you can actually find and it's fairly easy to grow. Um, some of the other ones uh, that you'll see out at the coast are a little bit more finicky or you can't find them anywhere to get them legally and you don't want to dig them out of the wild. No. So anyways, that, that is just a great one and it comes in typically in pink, but there are white forms as well. There's a few other species of calipogons if you do out, go out to the coast and you can see those as well, but I've never seen those for sale. Uh, but you can find calipogon tuberosus fairly easily. And then some other plants that uh, many people people think about when they think about a bog, at least here in North Carolina, uh, I have Dionia musipola, um, and you might be thinking, what in the world did he just say? Venus flytraps. So I'm not showing the traps, but um, I'm showing fo uh, flowers uh, growing in the wild again in uh, the Croatan, uh, along with uh, Polygola lutea, which is an annual um, milk uh, wart that's down there, which is, it looks like Cheetos, uh, or not Cheetos, corn uh, curls all through the field. It's that bright corn coral orange um, uh, sticking up out of the grass. Nice plantings of those at UNC Botanical. Yeah, they'll, they self sow. They have yeah. spectacular Beautiful. bog plantings Beautiful. behind their... Um, old visitor center. Yep. So the Venus flytrap you can see in that, uh, but you can grow those in a wet spot. They do need sun, that's a key thing. In the wild, they re require fire to keep things burnt off and that's whenever they, uh, they're they able to keep uh, things open and they're happy that way. Uh, but don't go again digging those in the wild buy them, they are readily available. Uh, don't torture them in your house, plant them outside or in a container that gets put outside. They do need to get chilled uh, through our winters, even though we have mild weather here. Um, and then the next plant after that is a kissing cousin of the Dionea, and it's actually in the same, uh, uh, the Dioneas, I believe are in the Drosseraceae, if I remember correctly which is the family that includes Drosera intermedia or sundews, which there's oh, at least four or five species uh, in North Carolina. Um, intermedia is a, rather, a fairly large growing one. It can get three or four, maybe six inches tall uh, in foliage wise uh, versus some of the other ones, which if you're lucky, some of them will be a, as big as your thumbnail. Um, <laughs> tiny. <laughs> tiny. tiny, or there's some that are in between that. And then um, Tracy Eye, I think is another one. And uh, there might be there's a, might be another one, but um, Brevifolia is tiny, Rotundifolia I've seen in the mountains. Uh, the coast you get cuspidal and brevifolia and, and intermedia and uh, one or two other species. But anyways, um, really cool to grow in a, um, in a wet spot. You can grow them in a wet pot too. Uh, just put them in a pot full of uh, uh, milled peat moss and sand and they're happy as a clam as long as it's fairly moist. Um, the ideal bog garden plants. Yes, exactly. And they will self-sow if they're happy. You can break off a leaf and root the leaf too. Um, so, uh, Continuing on that insectivorous uh, line are some of my favorites uh, are the Saracenias or pitcher plants. And I have a couple pictures of them in uh, one in the wild, one at a juniper level botanic gardens. Uh, and then I have some baby ones here. Um, uh, that we have in our nursery right now. Uh, these are complex hybrids, uh, but the one, the first uh, photo, Flava, which is the yellow pitcher plant, and it's probably about the most common one you're mm -hmm. gonna see down at the coast. And they get quite large, up to two and a half, three feet tall. You can see big patches of them if you get in the right unbelievable area. unbelievable to see it, that. And it's cool, yes. so cool. Um, and amongst those yellow ones, actually, there's the purple pitcher plant as well. Um, and the red pitcher plant is Rubra, which 
in that picture, there isn't any rubra. I know that because I know where that's at. But uh, there's rubra down there. There's a, one or two other species um, at the coast. And then there's a mountain species, which is super, super rare, Jonesy eye, uh, which grows on crazy rock outcrops with water constantly on them in the mountains. But anyways, these here are ones, at least these two have uh, uh, Leucophila as one of their parents. And I don't know who's in this one. This one's a little bit more complicated. It, has, it probably has some purpurea in it. But anyways, really cool plants um, to grow, whether in a, a small bog, a container, uh, or right in your ground, um, if, as long as you keep it moist to wet, they are content. Uh, so. You're probably asking me, is there anything I can grow in the shade or part shade? <laughs> um, so I did go down to the nursery and I found we have, I, I, these should, can be grown here. This is um, Primula japonica and I do have a picture of Primula japonica, but of course it was somewhere else. I think it was on uh, in Oregon when I took that picture, either that or in England, one or the other, uh, where they really do grow well. But we can grow, uh, if you get the right spot, you can grow Primula japonica, and they're the candelabra primrose, and they'll take part shade. Uh, so, um, you don't typically think of these doing well here. No, but they, they, but they will. Tony has them at, yeah. at Plant Delights Nursery in his bog gardens, uh, and they, they are so cool to see them in the wild. Uh, let's see, what else do I have here? Oh, the last plant that I have on my list that I remembered to put on, I have some other things, but we'll have to see here. Now, this is one, um, this is actually wild collected. The first picture I think I've included uh, is uh, Eryngium pandanifolium. And it's, uh, um, it's a picture that Mark took last March in Uruguay. And that's where this came from. This is wild collected seed from Uruguay. But we've been growing this species in the garden for several years. And uh, there's another picture, which is actually one of Blake's pictures um, uh, that I included there out in our rain garden out below the trial beds and uh, does great here. Uh, the picture, there were a couple pictures from Uruguay and there's water in the background. Mm -hmm. So it's fine and dandy if it gets wet, but I also have it growing in a container in the perennial border and it has survived and it hasn't gotten a drink and suffer when it rained for in the last month or so, and it was two months anyways, since we stopped having rain, it didn't get a drink until it's a week ago. It's getting one now. So, and it's starting to get a, a fresh drink right now, yes. So anyways, I'll quickly show, this is another cool plant. Uh, this looks terrible now. I just got this out of our Cascade garden, uh, which needed some uh, thinning. This is a, a prayer plant relative. So you think a prayer plant outside here, this is, uh, um, Thalia, um, I'm sp uh, oh, Diabata, I can't spit it out right now. Diabata. Anyway, Diabata. Diabata. Yeah. Uh, so this is one of the water, this is water canna. It's native to the Southeast and down into Central America and I think into South America as well. It does get canna leaf roller, which is probably where it originates up here. Uh, the know. host plant before we were growing cannas more readily up here. Um, but very happy in our cascade. Yes. Uh, so I, I was thinning it out the other day, cutting it back for the winter and pulling some of it out. I, I like it this time of the year because the leaves get kind of a yellow. They leaf. were really pretty. Yeah, it was very uh, but we, we wanted to get it cut back before it got real cold and it turned to mush because it was hard enough for me to cut it back on Monday. It, but it almost requires getting into the cascade. And I didn't want to do that the other up. day. No. So, but anyway, that's a cool one. Uh, and I mentioned some ferns earlier. This is uh, one of the maidenhair ferns, which kind of, we're growing the same situation in reality. It's might, uh, we're growing it on rock, but um, different uh, adiantums on our cascade wall and the, the um, down at the McSwain Center. And again, this is growing in the shade. This is a different cultivar, but this would grow perfectly well there. And this was in that same picture. This One of the parents of this one is in that picture that I showed from Guadalupe Mountain early on uh, with the lobelia in there. Uh, it's growing along the edge of a, 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 a spring head. But anyways, likes it wet. Down at the coast, you will see, as long as it's wet, you will see lots of ferns in full blazing sun doing fine and dandy. You'll see royal fern and cinnamon fern and netted chain fern all growing out in the uh, sun on the coast, which is worse than it is here in reality, uh, as long as it's that wet spot. Um, I mean, that's just a sampling of some of the things that you can grow. One thing I want to mention- Oh, I forgot the dogwood. Because it's here and it's a, it's a good one. Um, I'm not sure what that one is yet, but. And uh, 
exactly, but a good case in point. Um, the red twig dogwoods are, are good plants for, for wet situations. Yeah. And again, what we like about them is you get that winter interest with the, with the twigs. There's red ones, there's yellow ones, there's orange-ish ones. Um, all of them can take a little bit of, of, of wet feet and it's a great plant to, to add to, to your landscape for that uh, that sh that shrub layer. And one of my favorites, kind of kind of related, but not. But with uh, colored stems, there's lots of willows yeah. that'll work. Um, and you know, there's a couple at the front entrance to the arboretum near Pied Minaret that have nice orange color to them. Same. If you want trees. Um, uh, Salix nigra is a smaller growing willow, but keep in mind that willows tend to be kind of short-lived. They're not gonna be stately like an oak. Um, they're gonna reach an age and start to kind of decline, but they're good for wet situations. And I like the smaller ones that you can kind of cut back for that, that, that twig color. So that's a pretty good sampling of, of herbaceous and, and woody things. The I don't know. The great thing with the dogwoods and the willows is if you wanna get them established and you don't wanna have to dig in that mud, yep. you can just take sticks. I've done that before, just especially the willows. They'll, yeah. they'll grow in anything. They'll grow in anything. Where are we with uh, questions? Oh, we got some questions. Oh, no. Oh, we and like questions. And it's time for some questions. So okay. let's do some questions. Let's do some so, questions. Sue wanted to know, so you mentioned, you mentioned shade. Uh -huh. So could you just hit the highlights for the ones that do best in shade, but then can you also tell us which ones are deer resistant? <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe ferns. Yeah ferns in general. Yeah. They tend to be fairly deer resistant as mm. well as shade tolerant. Mm. Um, primrose, I don't know if the deer would might like those. Um, I, I don't think they do. But I don't know. Um, we had a lot of those at Holden and I don't remember them getting eaten Another plant is actually right behind us that we didn't talk about is a chorus gruminius. Yes. Uh, and there's Ogon's the most common one. Uh -huh. It could care less where it's at. Yeah. It'll actually grow sunshade, wet, dry. They even use it in aquariums for short periods. It's amount of time. I've had it in our Cascade garden. Actually, I had a big pot in the Cascade in one spot. And uh, when I ripped it out, it, it, there was a hunk still in the wall and I left it there. And then sure. we added it in a few other spots, but it'll grow in just about anywhere. And it's shade tolerant. It's uh, drought tolerant. It's wet tolerant. It's Flood tolerant, no problem. You name it, it's fine. I, I don't think- I don't think deer touch it. I don't think the deer, um, the deer won't eat the palm, that's for sure. No, and palms I, I have seen them nibble on the dogwoods, um, but I don't think it's something they go after all the time. But most everything else that's woody, they're, they're, gonna, they're gonna try it. I've not seen them eat Taxodium. Okay, that um, makes sense for the- The, the Chemisipyrus. I would I would go out on a limb, no pun intended, and say they're they're gonna they're gonna hit that pretty good. Mm. Um, you know, it's a horrible horrible problem that we had to deal with, and the list of things that they don't eat gets smaller all the all the time. Um, you it's know, like the, you, you, you go to a different part of the world and you eat try new foods too. And yeah, <laughs> I think that uh, and we, they can, they can be opportunistic. Yeah. They can be opportunistic when they decimate everything else. They start eating things they traditionally wouldn't. Mm. But um, yeah. It's, it's kind of buyer beware when it comes to deer, unfortunately. For sure. Okay, so Marilyn wants to know, what does hibiscus sawfly do? Uh, they, they shred the leaves. Okay. And they look really ugly. Uh, uh, they really don't bother the flowers all that much. Mm -hmm. uh, the Japanese beetles do that, but I don't have sure. that much of an issue for those in the garden. The thing so about the sawfly is they emerge at a certain time of the year when the temperatures are right. And if you're monitoring your garden, you can catch them before they become a problem. When they, when they, there are eggs that are on the foliage um, and then they emerge and they're very, very small, you can cut off a branch that has them on it and almost completely eliminate the problem. Mm. And so the key to success with them is to be out in your garden and kind of scouting and look for them and then physically remove them. If you wanted to go a little bit stronger than that, uh, a soap is gonna be good because it's gonna dry, the soap is gonna dry their bodies out, and oil is gonna do the same thing, and those two, those two products are gonna do less damage to other things, including yourself. Things that won't work though, I think, I don't think bacillus works on them, right? No, because, because it's they're a not, sawfly. It's, a, it's actually a wasp. Yeah, it's, 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 not a a, it's a different insect. It's not a, a it's not butterfly. A, it's not a lepidoptera. Yeah. yeah. So, and that's, they get confused with so many times. Yes, yes. Okie dokie. Darla is asking, do most of these plants bloom in the summer? Yes, most of these do bloom in the summer. But the uh. interest of the holly is uh, 
uh, in the winter. In a like like the primrose is late spring. Yep, sure. Um, you'll get if established Saracenias will flower in the spring. Um, and irises bloom all throughout the yeah, end growing season. It depends on what type. We've yes. got some that are blooming now. Those, those totally you wouldn't want to put, the bearded irish you would not want to put in a, a bog garden. No. no. Uh, mostly uh, early summer, late spring and early summer for a lot of them. Yeah. Okay. Vandy wants to know the teeny purple Saracenia. What was the specific episode? I don't have a, uh, a oh. for that teeny one, I don't have a, it's a hybrid. It's a hybrid. It's a, it's a complex hybrid. I don't know what it is. And we don't know what it is. You can't have it. You can't have it. She also wanted to know if it stays teeny tiny. It's not gonna, it should get probably, I'm gonna guesstimate about 12 to 15 inches when that one's mature. Mm -hmm. I uh, wish that it would because it's awful cute. It's so cute. It's so cute. I wanna, yeah, just kind of shove it in increasingly smaller pots and see if it See if it just takes what it's allotment. Okay, uh, Marilyn wants to know if Cornus sanguinea midwinter uh -huh. fire would do well with wet feet. I think it would. Yeah, that would yeah. be one to try definitely. And it, that's my one of my favorites. The yes. color on that is hard to hard to. You just with. have to keep them trimmed back to make to keep them refreshed. Every two to three, every yeah. three years, it's good to kind of. Yeah. yeah. And to follow up on that, Carolyn wants to know when's the best time of year to cut back the red twig dogwoods to keep them refreshed. <laughs> I mean, if you wanted to look nice through the winter, uh, it's great to do it right before they flush in the spring. That's, yes. that's and then what they I would will say. push up first thing in the spring. Yep. Uh, but if you want to use them for winter decoration, uh huh, uh, coming in the next couple of weeks. Yeah, right. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Early spring is traditionally yeah. the time to, time to do, do anything it. hard. Yeah, for sure. All right. So Jared says that. Tony Avon says that pitcher plants like wet feet but dry ankles. Yep, yep. Jared said he tried potting one outside in peat moss with holes drilled an inch down from yeah. the top of the surface soil, but it still died. Do you think that that was because it was too wet, not being able uh -uh. to drain out of the bottom? Uh -uh. You just want to have the crown a, a little bit above. Okay. That sounds like a perfect situation if you drilled the hole about an inch down. That should be fine. But sure. just have the crown. These have been sitting in water about yeah. uh, an inch and a half deep. For a while. For a long time. And that's the way uh, a friend of mine grows them uh, by the thousands. Okie dokie. Jennifer says, was the iris brevicollis the hybrid that you mentioned that's sterile? No, that is not. Hybris, uh, 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 iris brevicollis is one of the Louisianas and it is a species and I actually like it. Um, we have various forms here in the gardens, um, anywhere from white to purple to these mauvey pinks, which I find really cool. And they only get about a foot tall. The foliage does. The flowers are only about eight to 10 inches tall. Well, there are other, um, um, you're sitting in water. It's okay. <laughs> Keep it rolling, Tim. The Earth. computer's sitting in water. It is it is what it is. It's still working, Tim, okay? The you show must to... go on. Yeah, so, for anyways, sure. Yeah, Iris breath of uh, Collis, is, it, it's, it's quite different from the um, Sedatas, which those are gonna be three, even four foot tall when they flower, so. Okay. They can be giant. Okay, well, that looks like that is all of the <laughs> questions that we have for today. And we've successfully summoned appropriate we weather we for did. our bog plants today. So it. I think it is it is time for us humans to go inside so these sweet little bog plants can enjoy. I think it's more important you get that computer out of the water. Tim, you worry about these <laughs> things when there's no reason to- it's like my it's, computer. Yeah, for sure. It, 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 yes, it's our breeders. So I mean, <laughs> we're, we're good. <laughs> Anyway, thank you so much, Greg and Tim, for pulling this together, for showing us all these great plants. It was it was really thank, wonderful. Thank you for staying dry, yeah. our camera folks. Yeah, for sure. We've only got <laughs> dripped on a little here under the it's maple. No kidding, yeah. yeah. We They're fucked out. It's a good umbrella. Sitting pretty, for sure. Awesome. And thank you, everybody, for joining us today on the Midweek Program. Do you know something? We won't be back next week because it's a holiday week. Yeah. That's one of the so two you're not weeks a year. You're off? Okay. It's time yeah. off regardless. It's time to eat. One of the two weeks a year that we don't do the midweek program, but we will be back the following week. Oh, no. And what are we doing the following week? I think week? I heard it. Oh, it's cool swags from the garden, uh -huh. said Tim and Sophia. We talked or, about that yeah, this Tim morning. and Sophia yeah. are yeah. going to show us which, which plants are the most fun to, to decorate your, your winter hovel with. It is simple. Yeah, for Rich sure. So that should, be, that should be wonderful. We hope we will see you all for that one. Y'all take care. <laughs>